My name is Corey. I'm a digital marketing specialist at Brilliant Metrics. Um, today, we're going to be covering um, the webinar of marketing and death of the third party. And without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to our host, Steve Robinson, the founder and CEO of Brilliant Metrics. Thank you, Corey. Um, excuse me for being out of breath. I just had to run up and down the stairs. So um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please do ask questions, but we ask that you post them into the chat. So uh, the, uh, the goal here today is that Corey will be collecting those questions. At the end of the webinar, we'll make sure that every question gets addressed. Um, the other thing is any resources that we present today will be emailed to you. Give it a couple of days for us to get that email together and we'll get that sent right off. A little bit about me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I know we've got a few friendly faces in the room. Um, I got about 20 years of experience bouncing back and forth between software development and marketing. Uh, the last 10 years have been dedicated as the founder and CEO of Brilliant Metrics. We are a digital first marketing agency. I also teach a variety of digital marketing courses at UW Milwaukee School of Continuing Ed. And uh, finally, I'm married with three beautiful children. Uh, hopefully none of them will, uh, will pop in here. Okay, um, Brilliant Metrics, uh, our agency, we are B2B, we are digital first, meaning we prefer to start with digital and then add traditional after we, uh, after we have an opportunity to experiment and figure out what's working. Um, and if you were to ask our clients, I would say that they generally uh, choose us and choose to stay with us because, well, we, we help them grow, we help them be stronger. Um, we help them continuously get to the next level, um, whether that's with their knowledge um, as we're doing today, or whether that's we're through uh, capabilities or technology, um, that's really the value proposition. Now, without further ado, let's get into the meat of today's presentation. Uh, today we're talking about cookies. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how cookies at least used to work. Then we're gonna talk about some of the implications for what that means for paid media specifically and then what that means for analytics. Before we can do that, we need to talk about what, what a cookie is, right? So uh, a cookie uh, gets, I guess, maligned a lot today in the media, but it's really nothing more than just a, a little snippet of text that, that a web page can ask your browser to save or store. So it, it, it's storage, really, is what it is. It's data storage inside of your browser that web pages can access. There are two core types of cookies. Um, the first is first-party cookies. So you can think about a first-party cookie like uh, you're visiting the New York Times. And while you're on the New York Times, you have to log in. And once you're logged in, they don't, uh, they don't put up paywalls in front of you, et cetera, et cetera. But New York Times has to remember who you are and that you're logged in. And so they'll use a first party cookie to do that. Now, when they do that, they store a, a unique identifier for you in the browser. Only the New York Times has access to that ID. They, they're the, they're the, the first and only party to that identifier. They set it, they read it, they know that you're logged in, they don't present a paywall. Now contrast that when you're visiting newyorktimes.com and uh, let's just say there's a fictitious evilads.co out there, okay? And they made a deal with New York Times to put a script on newyorktimes.com to help them target people with ads. Now in this case, evilads.co can also put a cookie in your browser and that cookie can uniquely identify you so that evilads.co knows more about you. And the key here though is only evilads.co can read that cookie. They set it, they can read it. But they set it when you were on newyorktimes.com, not when you were on evilads.co's website. You would never visit evilads.co website. So th that's a third party cookie when the cookie is set and read by a party, a, 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 a website other than the one that you're visiting. So let's talk about how this translates into the current controversy, right? Because in and of itself, we're just storing little snippets of information, which is perfectly harmless. But 
where privacy advocates like this guy, I guess, get all of an arms is that these snippets can be these personal IDs, these identifiers. And if enough publishers and websites are storing these IDs on behalf of these, these tech and data companies, then these tech and data companies can start to piece together a whole lot of information about you and me as we bounce around the internet. And it gets to the point that even if they don't know our name, they can figure it out or they know a whole lot about what we do, where we bank, what we like, what we don't like, our political views. Uh, enough information that, that, that people who are concerned about privacy have gotten really concerned. But let's, let's take a look at what this looks like. So let, let's take a hypothetical guy. We'll say Bill Smith. Bill Smith is really into motorcycles. So he's out reading about motorcycles on, on, on Motorcycle Pub A, right? And while he's out there reading, um, Motorcycle Pub A has a deal with uh, one of these data companies, this third-party data company, okay? So because Motorcycle Pub A has a deal with third-party data company, they put a script on Motorcycle Pub A. And so that script goes to look, well, do we have this browser? Have we seen it before? Did we store a cookie with an ID for this browser? And the script goes, no. So it sets one. It sets a unique identifier for that browser. and uh, ostensibly Bill Smith. And then it sends a tracking signal back to the third-party data company. Somebody with this ID was on Motorcycle Pub Bay and they looked at these pages. So the next day, Bill Smith goes to Motorcycle Pub B. Now Motorcycle Pub B also has a deal with this third-party data company. Now the script checks and looks for this cookie and it sees it this time. So it doesn't have to set one. It reuses that same unique identifier for Bill Smith and says, okay, now this browser has been to this publication and been to these pages. The next day, Bill Smith goes to visit Motorcycle Pub C. Same thing. Script looks, finds a cookie, finds an ID, phones home, says, hey, third-party data company, this browser has been to Pub C and visited these pages. Now, it's important to note third-party data company at this point might not know who Bill Smith is. And they also might know who Bill Smith is because if, if Bill Smith logged into any of these, depending on the privacy agreement, one of these publications could have shared his name and email address back to the third-party data company as well. But let's just say they don't, and they just know his browser. A couple days later, Bill Smith is out on Slate.com reading some, some pop culture news, right? And uh, Slate is needing to present Bill with an ad, right? So they, uh, they reach out to their ad vendor and say, hey, I want to serve up an ad. The ad vendor goes, okay, give me the cookies off the browser. And they grab, they grab the cookies, including cookies from the third-party data company. And they go say, hey, third-party data company, what do we know about Bill Smith? And the, uh, and the, and the third-party data company says, well, he's really into motorcycles. And then so the ad tech company then goes and finds somebody to bid on someone who's really into motorcycles. And next thing you know, there's a motorcycle ad on slate.com. This all is relatively innocuous, right? I mean, like, we're just personalizing ads. We're making ads more personal. The problem comes in when it starts getting done at the scale that it's currently being done at. And that's where you start to see issues. And that scale alarmed the privacy advocates. And one company in particular saw an opportunity to capitalize on some of this fear and cement themselves as the the, the, the privacy knight in shining armor. That company is Apple. And so as a consumer, we can all thank Apple for starting the, uh, the movement to restrict the ability for these tracking cookies to cause us harm. As the advertising industry and as marketers, we can blame our Apple, right? It's their fault for causing all this mess. But regardless, starting in about 2017, Apple started introducing something called ITP or Intelligent Tracking Protection that went to go and stop 
these, uh, these tracking cookies from being able to track people uh, as they move from site to site to site without a direct relationship. Because Bill Smith didn't have a relationship with the third party data company that amassed all that information about him. Um, I, when I was browsing NewYorkTimes.com, didn't have a relationship with EvilAds.co, right? It's uh, the lack of relationship, the lack of consent that Apple took an issue with. I want to clarify something here. At the beginning, I talked about the difference between first party cookies and third party cookies. And um, I did that because a lot of the media and the, well, little, little press, because there should be a lot more press there is about this, really talks about the death of third party cookies or third party cookies being locked down. The truth of the matter is there's a bit of a cat and mouse game going on between uh, the ad industry and uh, Apple, Mozilla, and others advocating for privacy. And uh, the ad industry figured out how to use first party cookies in the same way as third party cookies. And so the protections in place actually go beyond just third party cookies. So from now on, I'm going to refer to them as tracking cookies, which is another industry term, so as to be more accurate and not say third party when it, it goes beyond third party cookies. So what's the impact here? Well, if you look on the screen here, you'll see um, this is a rough breakdown of, of, of market share of browsers uh, as of January. And this is a mixture of mobile and desktop. If we were just talking mobile, Safari would be a whole lot bigger. If we were just talking desktop, Safari would be a whole lot smaller and Chrome would be a whole lot bigger. But if you mash it up all together, this is uh, you know session by session, a rough breakdown of what percentage of uh, sessions are, are by which browser. Now, in, I, said, so I said Apple started rolling out ITP, the, the, the tracking protection in about 2017, but it didn't really have the, the, the teeth that it has today until early 2020. And that's when you started to see some issues with some of your metrics on mobile. And that's when you started to see some of your reach start to drop because that's really when these tracking cookies became not possible to set in Safari. And it didn't take long after for Mozilla, um, basically right on the heels of Safari. Uh, once, once Apple worked out all the kinks, Mozilla jumped right on board. And Edge, who just basically took all of Apple's code and rolled it, Microsoft rolled it right into the Edge browser to jump on board and start blocking these tracking cookies as well. So where we sit today is about 54% of all sessions don't allow tracking cookies. Now that doesn't mean they don't show up in, in Google Analytics, they do, but there are implications and I'll get into those later. This is the scary part. Google uh, had a decision to make. They could ignore the, the, the movement in privacy and uh, continue to allow third-party cookies and tracking cookies, which they did for a long time. Uh, or they could jump on board with everyone else and embrace the privacy. Uh, and ironically enough, and we'll talk about this later, it, it, it actually helps their business to jump on the privacy bandwagon. So in 2022, they have declared there will be no more tracking cookies in Google Chrome, which means for all practical purposes, 100% of web sessions will not have any tracking cookies on them whatsoever. Let's talk about the impacts. They're really twofold. First, there are some impacts to ad targeting. And second, there are impacts to analytics. We're going to dive into ad targeting first. When we look at ad targeting, there are three types of ad targeting, uh, specifically in the programmatic area, that are that are hurt. Although I, I would say second party also hits social. Um, third party is pretty much dead, and I'll explain why in a moment. 
second party um, interest-based targeting is, um, we'll say minorly injured. It's just a flesh wound as it says in the GIF there. Um, retargeting is hurting pretty badly. It's on life support and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that too. So let's talk about interest-based targeting. This is where you are trying to reach people who are interested in a particular thing, usually your product or service right now. Uh, in the past, you could use a variety of different demand side platforms or media buying platforms to go and reach these third party audiences of people who are interested in your stuff. For a brief period, this, these audiences were available even inside of Facebook. Uh, they were available in Twitter up until recently. Um, these third party uh, uh, third parties are used extensively in uh, demand side platforms or DSPs or media buying platforms like the Trade Desk or Centro um, as a means of targeting. Uh, the biggest players in this industry are Lotomy, Exalate, and what used to be Blue Chi and is now Oracle Data Cloud. Um, these are the ones that are pretty much DOA right now. They're dead on arrival. They're not going to be coming back to life in the same form uh, after Chrome kills uh, tracking cookies. But there's another way that you can target people based on what they're interested in today. And those are the second party targeting platforms. This is when you're buying ads in Google, in the Google Ads platform or through uh, 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 the Google uh, marketing suite, targeting Google's own audiences. When you buy ads on Facebook, targeting Facebook interest-based audiences, or ads in Amazon targeting their interest audiences. These are very different from the third parties. Uh, you and I don't have relationships with Lotomy, Exalate, or Oracle. We don't go and visit their websites. We don't share things on their websites. We don't engage with their content. They have to make deals with publishers to get their data. But when we look at these second party platforms, well, they know all about us. Uh, Google knows everything you've ever searched for, every YouTube video you've watched, possibly every email you've ever sent or received if you, if you use Gmail. Facebook knows everything you've searched for, everything you liked, commented, shared, or even just paused slightly as you were scrolling through your feed. And Amazon obviously knows everything you've bought uh, at least they are anything you've added to your cart, researched, um, et cetera. So um, these companies have all the information they need to know what you're into and what you're interested in. They don't need to go and partner with third parties and track your web, tra web, your web tra traffic in order to understand you. They own the data already. And so as marketers, um, and we call, by the way, we call this a walled garden, meaning Facebook has the data to target and to measure their people, but we can't mix that data with any other programmatic or media buying. I can't use Facebook audiences to go target on uh, Google ads. Um, the, the, so they're, they're, they're called walled gardens. And these walled gardens work now to our benefit before they worked to our detriment because we had a really hard time mixing data between platforms. Um, particularly in the measurement arena. But now these walled gardens are working to our benefit because they don't rely on any tracking cookies to function. So what can we expect? Well, as I'm sure you've seen, we've seen some drop in, in, in reach uh, due to some of these limitations. Uh, our audiences are smaller than they used to be. That will continue again, worsen slightly because while uh, these platforms aren't reliant on these tracking cookies. They also didn't ignore them. They have taken advantage of some of this technology to help bolster their audiences. Uh, the other thing is if you're coming from third party targeting, those third party platforms, the Lotomies, the uh, Axolates, uh, the, the Blue Kais and others of the world, they had some really niche targeted audiences. 
can get down to very specific income levels or or very specific interests and you try and do the do the same thing in in google ads or in facebook and you're going to be sadly disappointed at the level of targeting that you're able to do so as marketers we need to be comfortable with that now for those of you who are brilliant metrics uh clients we've never been big fans of third-party audiences anyway so we've we we're pretty good at working within uh, second party audiences when we need to. Um, but for others who have been dependent on those third parties, the, the, the key is uh, go broader because you're not going to have that narrowness and let the algorithms go and find your audience within these broader segments. And then finally, if you're using a display partner other than Google, um, it's time to make the switch. Uh, uh, we'll get into a little, a little bit later some of the specifics, but because Google has that direct relationship, they have the targeting ability that nobody else does in the display uh, arena. Um, again, Brilliant Metrics clients, we are partnered with Google. There is also an alternative. You don't have to use these interest-based audiences. There are uh, lots of ways to target digital media. Um, one of them that is having a new revived heyday is uh, contextual targeting. And here, you don't know if that person's really qualified, um, but you know that they're at least reading content on the right topics. So you see on the screen here, we've got an article on e-commerce and Shopify is all over this article with ads, right? And so um, don't be afraid to do some more experimentation now in contextual, especially if you're relying on any of these interest-based audiences in order to grow, uh, grow your audiences. So interest-based targeting in 2021, um, again, use second party data, not third party data. If, if that means changing partners to Google from the trade desk or Centro or another demand side platform, now's the time to make the switch use algorithms to overcome a lack of fidelity because those third-party audiences were really, really niche and narrow. Um, let the algorithms find your audience within a larger pool. And then finally, consider incorporating more contextual ads. Um, you're not going to get the same confidence in that audience being who you need it to be. It could be students, you know, researching things. It could be um, uh, people are uh, reading that content for a wide variety of different reasons that are not necessarily qualified, but um, it's still people reading the right content. Let's talk about retargeting. So the way retargeting used to work is you'd put a tracking code on your website right, or on specific pages of your website, and visitors then, uh, their browsers would go and ping notify uh, your retargeting vendor or ad networks that someone had visited your page. Now, in order to do that, they had to have stored on in in a cookie uh, a unique identifier that they could send back to those ad networks so that when they spotted your visitor on another page, they could deliver a personalized ad. The, the problem is that um, the browsers can't set that identifier when someone's visiting your website. And since they can't set the identifier, they can't spot your visitors on other ad networks. And so if you've been doing retargeting in 2020 and 2021, you've noticed that there's been a drop in your reach. Um, if you continue to do retargeting into uh, 2022, you're going to find that drop is much greater. Now there is a loophole. And that loophole is that traffic from within one walled garden, one vendor, right, who has their own audience can be retargeted back on that same vendor. So for example, in the diagram here, we have Google ads to Google ads. And the way this works is if I click an ad in a Google ad, there's um, some additional information that's put in, in the click, in the URL, that uh, is an identifier. So that when I visit uh, a company's website, their website knows who I am. And uh, it can't remember it for very long, and we'll get into why in a moment, but it knows who I am in the moment. 
and it can go back out and reach back out to Google Ads and say, hey, um, the person who clicked on this ad also visited this page that we want to retarget off of. And now Google can spot that person for a little while. It's imperfect though. Um, and uh, it relies on, on, on the platform being able to spot that person afterwards, which for Google ads is a bit tricky. For Facebook, it's a lot easier because you log into Facebook and the ads are delivered inside the platform. So the same trick works for Facebook. If somebody clicks an ad off of Facebook, visits your website, um, your website knows who that person is, uh, they can go and ping Facebook when they take actions on your website that you want to retarget off of, but only if they clicked an ad off of Facebook, because otherwise Facebook can't know who that person is. And there's some limitations here. I said there were two types of cookies, first party and third party, but there's uh, another way you can, you can split up cookies, and that is client side and server side. A client side cookie works like this. Some script that you have loaded on your website right, usually from a third party, um, says to your browser, could, could you please remember this? And the browser says, sure. This is, how, um, this is how cookies are set for retargeting tags. This is how cookies are set for Google Analytics. Um, this is how cookies uh, are, used to be set for uh, some marketing automation platforms until they moved over to server-side cookies. This works when your browser asks the server for something and the server serves it up. And then the server says, oh, by the way, could you also please remember such and such? Could you also set this cookie? This is how logins work. This is how uh, marketing automation platforms remember who someone is. When, when one of your prospects clicks an email from your marketing automation platform, um, the browser sets uh, a cookie from the server side. When uh, somebody fills out a form on your website, the browser sets a cookie from the server side. And with, with some limitations, there are drastic differences in how long these cookies are allowed to stick around. Cookies set client side have a 24 hour memory. Uh, after 24 hours, they're forgotten. So you have uh, uh, browsers that get really forgetful when their cookies are set by scripts. Cookies that are set server-side have up to a two-year memory. So much better memory when things are set server-side. Now remember, Facebook, ad platforms, all set client-side cookies your marketing automation and your logins, your, um, if you've got a community people can log into or uh, content, that's set server side. And so you have persistent IDs on those records waiting to be used within your marketing automation platform, within your e-commerce platform, within your, um, uh, your uh, community, your web website community platform, whatever you're running to to allow people to log in uh, to forums or or other gated content, those IDs are available for you to attach along with tracking requests. And so what this looks like is um, you can do something like in Google Tag Manager, you can share that persistent ID from that login or that marketing automation platform back to the ad tech vendor like Facebook. And now Facebook has another way to remember that person using an identifier that can last up to two years. Whereas before Facebook could only remember somebody for 24 hours. And so uh, the result is that you can extend that 24 hour window in retargeting for a lot longer if you use these external IDs because the next time, next time somebody comes back to your website, your marketing automation platform will recognize them or they'll log in and get recognized. And now um, that same identifier will be sent back to the ad tech company saying, hey, we found Bill Smith again 
and uh, they'll sync up the records on their side. There is an alternative to retargeting altogether, and that is if you can increase the fidelity of your audiences within your marketing automation platform or CRM platform to know who's in market and who you want to go back and retarget, you can leverage CRM targeting. The big catch here is we're talking audiences over a thousand people. So if your audience is under a thousand, this isn't a tactic that you can use. So retargeting in 2021 uh, and, and into 2022, you want to include per persistent IDs in all tracking calls. Again, for the Brilliant Metrics clients on the call, this is something that we're already rolling out. Um, you want to retarget on the same platform that you target new traffic whenever possible, because cross-platform uh, cross retargeting isn't, isn't going to work. And then, um, you want to use only partners that your audience logs into daily. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, uh, again, those cookies are only readable for 24 hours. So if somebody hasn't logged into uh, the platform in the last 24 hours, then they're not going to be reachable in any retargeting capacity. And then finally, um, consider using CRM data in, in addition to or in lieu of cookie-based technology to reach these audiences. All right, flipping out of paid media, let's talk about tracking. Let's talk about uh, analytics. These cookie changes also have a significant impact on an advertiser's ability to figure out what's working. Most of the um, most of the trade desks uh, relied on some of this tech in order to do their analytics. You got to remember there are two ways to set cookies, client side and server side. And well, Google Analytics does it the client side way. So out of the box, Google Analytics only has a 24 hour memory. Um, what, what can you do to improve that? Well, first of all, if you haven't already, you need to upgrade the code that's on your site to the more modern GTAG analytics. Um, again, if you're a BrillMet client, we already did this, but if you haven't, you need to do it. If you're running Google Tag Manager, this means adding the conversion linker tag. Second, those same persistent IDs, those identifiers that you have in your e-commerce platform or your marketing automation platform, you can actually sync those with analytics too. Uh, this is something that we're still testing and getting our hands around the implications of before we roll it out to all clients, but um, we're preparing to include user IDs in our analytics calls to uh, allow to, uh, to make up for that, that faulty 24 hour memory that the browser has for client, uh, for client side cookies um, with that two year memory that it has for server side cookies like come from your marketing automation platform. If you're doing conversion optimization, you want to look at conversions in Google Analytics, not conversions in the individual ad platforms. You can't rely on the ad platform's memory of where that person came from. Um, depending on how you've synced other external identifiers, those persistent IDs, it gets a little bit better, but it's still sketchy at best. You really want to use Google Analytics as your single uh, version of the truth of who converted and who didn't. This means getting religious about tagging your media and making sure every URL is tagged so you know where it came from and ideally what creative they clicked on so you can do your comparisons and your optimizations on, on revenue generated and conversions in the analytics platform, not in the media platform. So analytics in 2020, one and beyond. You're going to want to A, make sure you're running the latest code. Um, B, you're going to want to use that persistent ID that you have hanging around in your marketing automation platform or in your uh, email marketing platform. Um, use that persistent ID uh, to sync back up 
with Google Analytics to maintain who a user is. This will keep your stats on repeat visitors accurate. And then um, use analytics for your conversions. Tag everything religiously and look at analytics. That might also mean uh, going back a little bit more old school in your experiments and not running as many experiments in the ad platforms themselves and instead running your experiments over uh, analyzing the success of your experiments in analytics instead of in the ad platforms. So that's it for the presentation today. Uh, I'd like to open things up for questions. Uh, Corey has been collecting these questions. Um, Corey, what do you have? Thanks, Steve. Uh, that was extremely informative. Um, I will jump into the first question that I see here. And um, under the retargeting in 2021 section, Jessica asks, uh, do, we think that the do you think that the price of social ads will increase when the privacy mandates are final? Um, I think we're already seeing some of those prices go up. Um, and conversely, uh, programmatic rates uh, um, are uh, going down um, be, for un less targeted media. So um, yes, this will have an impact. And I do expect that social advertising, any advertising within these walled gardens will continue to go up in price. And advertising bought outside of these walled gardens will continue to go down in price. Uh, the wild card there is contextual because it is sort of the saving grace for for some of this this programmatic. But because that's bought alongside any other programmatic inventory, um, I would expect the prices there to be um, stable, if not actually go down as uh, less targeted inventory becomes available. Great, awesome. Um, I had another question here that was sent via a direct message, um, again, on retargeting in 2021. Um, the question asks, one of the recommendations for retargeting in 2021 is to only use partners that your audience logs into daily. How does this fact, how does LinkedIn factor into this? Uh, this user says that they see some of their best B2B traffic, but they know that they do not log onto LinkedIn daily. Should they still use it? Um, yeah, uh, LinkedIn is, um, when we were talking about using platforms that people log into daily, that's really when you're advertising on the web. Um, LinkedIn, your ads are being delivered inside of LinkedIn. So LinkedIn actually has a different problem when it comes to retargeting in that um, because people don't log in daily, you end up with uh, very limited reach if you're trying to do any sort of niche retargeting on LinkedIn. Um, so it, it ends up being hard to make the justification for the cost of placing and creating the ads um, on that platform. In some cases, if you don't have a really large target uh, audience to retarget. Um, and at this point in time, uh, you know, Amazon has some display capabilities. Um, if you're B2C and uh, Google has display capabilities. And those are really the two players that people log into almost daily for display retargeting, which is really what I was referring to there. Great, thanks Steve. Um, another question here from Jessica was asking, um, are the browser policies worldwide that we're um, seeing? Yes, um, these browser policies are global. Uh, they are, uh, sort of a reflection of some of the regulation, the privacy regulation that we're seeing out here. Um, but as far as I know, GDPR, CCPA, um, the, the, the Brazilian one that I can't remember, um, those, uh, those legislations haven't really dictated any of these changes. Uh, it's been more of a preemptive strike, again, led by Apple to increase the privacy of the web um, because it was abused, uh, the, these technologies were abused. Um, so uh, because it's not really being driven by these, these policies in, in, in Europe and uh, in California and uh, in Brazil and other countries, it's not, um, 
it's not a regional thing. It's pretty much globally. Great. Um, looks like we've got another question here. Um, are the pop-ups on websites that say this website uses cookies, please accept, will those still be necessary or are those going to be out of date going forward? No, those are still very much so necessary because again, uh, all of this is really impacting tracking cookies. Um, it's definitely impacting third-party cookies, but it's also impacting, again, some of those first-party cookies that are, that are tracking specific. Um, those uh, cookie notices um, are required even for first-party cookies, like login information. I, I mean, e even in those instances, um, you're still tracking information. The other thing is uh, Google Analytics uses first party cookies in order to work and and those are those are those are tracking cookies but they're okay under um under the privacy uh, uh changes these browsers are rolling out they just have a shorter lifespan that 24 hour lifespan so we're still going to be using cookies um first party cookies are still perfectly okay um I wouldn't be surprised if there are some future changes to what kind of first party cookies are okay. Uh, there's a whole another round of this uh, this cat and mouse game that's going to come down here here shortly. But um, just know that that cookies as a technology will be around for a long time. How they are used will be different. Awesome. It looks like we've got one final question here, um, and that asks, how can we help, how can these changes help companies who want to grow their target audiences in a very smaller niche market segment slash sub-segment? I, I, I think that these, cha these changes uh, give marketers an opportunity to um, get rid of a crutch. If you have been using third-party targeting, you've been missing out. Uh, third party targeting is not very accurate. And so if you have been using that, you've been missing out on the opportunity to use some of um, the more traditional tactics of building an audience. Um, email marketing and building CRM databases and lists of people who are engaged with your product or service offering. Uh, first party data is is king. The data you collect yourself as a brand is king. And these changes really force marketers to become less dependent and reliant on these third parties. And um, really, we'll, we'll all come out stronger in the end um, and be able to offer a little bit more privacy to our, our prospects in the process. Great. And I think that should cover all the questions that we had outstanding. I appreciate everyone's time today. And uh, thank you very much for making the time to visit. Um, we'll get an email out with a recording of the webinar and anything else that, uh, uh, that we talked about today that seems relevant.